welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and today my guest is economist Amartya Lahiri, who is the Royal Bank Faculty Research Professor at the Vancouver School of Economics at the University of British Columbia. We spoke about the macroeconomic health of the Indian economy, the need to reform, demonetization and the goods and services tax, liberalization in India and its impact on poverty and inequality, Amartya's intellectual influences and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi, Amartya. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great meeting you for the first time. Yes. I've been following you for a long time. It's been an absolute pleasure to actually get to talk to you face to face. You've argued, and you know, this is your paper with Urjit Patel, that large deficits, you know, fiscal dominance by the state, especially when it's combined with, you know, specific policies in India, like the statutory liquidity ratio requirements, can render monetary policy quite ineffective. Now, in the post-COVID world, given that India has undergone a severe economic contraction, And the prescription by most people, including yourself, is that India needs to announce a large fiscal spending package. How do we think about monetary policy, given that deficits are going to be large in the next, you know, decade or so? Does this mean that monetary policy is not going to be a very good tool in the policymakers toolkit? This issue has wider ramifications than India, but... In general, I think there has been, in the developing world, there has been far more reticence in expanding fiscal support relative to the easy option, which is to lean on the central bank and say, do something. I mean, you know, because it's not coming out of my pocket directly. It just seems like uh, an easy thing to do. And that's what most developing country governments have tried to follow that strategy. They've relied a lot more on central banks to do the uh, do the heavy lifting. Fiscal space is much more limited in uh, developing countries. And that in turn reflects fairly long history of living beyond their means. I mean, which is all a lot of these countries have indeed had sort of large fiscal deficits for uh, India in particular, for sure, has had big, big deficits for a long period of time. And as a result, I mean, the public debt in India is, I think, about 90% of GDP, so it's, it's pretty high, which limits how much you can potentially do. So this whole thing that you raised earlier about, you know, this paper with Urjit Patel, where we were talking about, you know, various kinds of frictions that were introduced into the Indian monetary system, were also ways in which the government was finding ways to acquire cheap access to credit. And so SLR, the statutory liquidity ratio, is exactly another one of those. where It's the uh, cheapest, it's, actually. It's the cheapest, saying that, you know, will you hold my debt and I'll give you some special breaks. You know, and guess what? I'll also make it compulsory for you to do this because what that does is that it begins to commingle fiscal and monetary policy in a very, very organic way. Whereas the approach pretty much globally has been to try and separate. And there's a reason for wanting to separate those two arms, the fiscal arm and the monetary arm. At some level, I mean, if you think of a government as being an integrated government, that it's collecting revenues and it's spending on different you know, spending goals, how does it matter whether we hand taxes to some notional subdivision of the government called the fiscal authority? And another source of revenues that we are handing over to a monetary authority, why not combine the two? And I think it has a lot to do with short-term versus long-term trade-offs. And that's uh, one of the things about independence of the monetary authorities. The taxpayer is handing over part of his revenues directly to the fiscal uh, guy. And part of his revenues is holding back and transferring to the government through this indirect route. Uh, The fiscal authorities, you know, I think everybody understands is much more under the influence of direct political pressure of, you know, wanting to spend in order to uh, maximize political gains beyond other standard economic uh, arguments that you might have. And in order to minimize those things, you might want to put money into another, you know, agency of the government, which is relatively siloed from these political pressures. And that's the whole argument for independence, because without that, you might say, Who cares? I mean, you can have the central bank running as a separate entity within the finance ministry itself. The flip side of it, that when you don't have much fiscal space 
and the economy is basically on a life support. If there's ever a period or a time when you want spending to, and I'll come to this issue of what my take on why we need fiscal spending much more, but, you know, given the need right now to rely on a monetary authority to do the heavy lifting is potentially a problem simply because, you know, the main instrument the monetary authority has is to make lending cheaper or or more expensive. Now, that depends on whether people want to borrow or not. People are choosing whether to borrow or not based on how far they think the return on this money is going to go, unless people say that it's a free, you know, you don't have to pay back, which also has happened in the Indian banking system where you have a mountain of non-performing assets. So you might think that there is a lot of, you know, in technical terms, there's a lot of adverse selection that has gone on that people have, and moral hazard as well, that, you know, people have borrowed knowing they don't have to pay back. I mean, so there is that, that aspect to it. But for the major part, when people borrow, they borrow because they're going to put the money to work. They expect to earn a return from it. And part of that return is going to be, you know, used to repay the debt. If confidence is completely shaken and nobody knows what the return is going to be on this money going forward, making money cheaper is not going to induce people to borrow. And so one of the things we've seen in India is that we've had, uh, you know, lending growth, credit growth has been correlating positively with the policy rate, the repo rate, which has been being reduced. They've been cutting repo rates at three years, actually, now. Lending growth has been going down. So people aren't borrowing, uh, even though rates are coming down. What that also is showing up is the mix of borrowers is worsening as well, which is why the spreads have stayed up. So the guys who are willing to borrow are mostly the more risky guys. The whole Indian story of growth since the 1990s has really been the structural transformation, which has been a key part of India, which is about people, employment and economic activity has moved from agriculture to non-agriculture. But within non-agriculture, it's been moving a lot towards this service sector oriented stuff. That's where a lot of the employment growth has happened. The problem is that is a segment that is basically, you know, serviced by a lot of lower income urban workers. And the demand for it comes from high end, upper middle class urban consumers. And it relies a lot on face to face exchanges. So whether this is retail, uh, all kinds of retail consumption, whether it's uh, going to malls, whether it's shopping, whether it's going to restaurants, whether it's going, you know, tourist destinations, all of that ecosystem is where a lot of this employment has grown. And, and that's where it has centered in. And, and at the same time, what, what has happened with this shock is, you know, that demand for that stuff has just disappeared. That has completely collapsed. Uh, that spending is essentially discretionary spending of the upper middle class and richer components of India, you know, because most of those are white collar workers who can sit at home and do what they're doing, like most of us are doing. I mean, so they have been able to continue to, uh, you know, have their income sources relatively less hammered than the other groups. And yet this discretionary avenue to spend has somehow disappeared. So what these guys have been doing is putting their money into stock markets, stock, which is, which why is right have, now booming, right? Booming. That's yeah. the and reason, this is right? not just India. It's booming everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And, yeah. And a big part is exactly this. Saving rates of these groups has actually gone up. And so they need spaces to spend. And on the other hand, the lower middle class and the poorer sections of urban India, which are, which are relying on this spending, that is their livelihood. That's where they're employed. These guys have nothing. And this is why they were heading back the moment everything got shut down. They have nothing to sustain them themselves. So this heading back to their villages, this rural, you know, reverse migration that was happening around shutdown times is all related to this. And so until we have some sort of a fiscal spending, which tries to take care of these guys in particular, you know, you're going to see a very, very depressed economy. So two things have to happen. <laughs> One is that the economy has to open up. Because without opening up, this face-to-face transactions are not going to happen. And if they don't happen, this segment of demand is not coming back. And so to do that, people have to feel safe enough to go and do this, you know, the standard travel, hospitality, retail shopping, etc. that they used to do. In order to do that, you need to have the sense that public health is uh, under control. And these workers, public health, you know, interventions are helping them in the sense that the vaccination drive is deep enough that, you know, most of these guys have been taken care of. All of this requires a lot of spending. And on top of that, just the pure social disruption of this massive chunk of urban India, which is living essentially without any social insurance schemes to take care of them, 
this is where the government has to earn its keep. There is so many yojanas we have, but we have none for the urban worker. I mean, you know, so we have to have some sort of an urban narega, I mean, without which I don't know where these guys go. There's a number of things I want to pick up on from here. So the first is when it comes to an a government which has routinely had very very large deficits not just the current government but historically all governments one of the big tools ends up being co-opting monetary policy such that rates are low enough for the government and the government can one get cheap credit and to move a lot of its spending and debt off the books right so that's that's one part of what's going on in the process of government control over the monetary policy framework and also the banks because a lot of the big banks are nationalized there's also a cronyist element to this which is you know the adverse selection that you talked about which is the worst people in the business who are least likely to pay things back and are very risky end up getting big loans through politically connected means and then because of various incentives that nobody wants to get caught they keep evergreening these loans the third part of that is that a lot of the private sector credit operations are getting crowded out so any kind of fixed capital formation that takes place in an economy is now that much costlier when it's private fixed capital formation right i mean if the government is having these huge deficits for its side of the capital formation that's great but that doesn't seem to be the case with the indian government it's not really capital spending right it's all revenue very revenue driven we spend on fertilizer subsidy and things like that then the last part of it is the savers in the economy really get a terrible deal right now because they're essentially subsidizing the government so now all these four things put together mean that there is very little cushion in the economy when things go wrong right savers don't have huge incentive to save when the times are good so when the times are bad you know the cushions are very very low the incentive was to spend and on the side of the governments now it seems like my original question is almost moot because both fiscal policy and monetary policy have been rendered ineffective during the time of the pandemic you have overspent so much in the past that you can't announce a huge fiscal package and given how much you overspent in the past and you intend to in the present your monetary policy is going to be quite ineffective given all the other institutions you've built around yourself this seems very bleak <laughs> you know so i like the way you plotted the into a, you know four quadrant thing i think that's exactly right the big issue here though is is it just a chicken and the egg kind of thing or is there some way of breaking this uh, vicious cycle and so this is where i thought that the only hope right now is to somehow put in enough of a fiscal boost in there you know in three different areas so one is clearly fiscal boost on just ramping up vaccine supplies and providing it for free instead of trying to you know nickel and dime the states and so on the second part is just providing this urban some sort of income support for the urban low middle classes this is the group that actually has suffered the most i mean so i've done some work on rural urban uh, disparities in india and one of the things you see is the gaps have actually shrunk a lot between rural and urban workers and a lot of that has to do with the worst position to be in in india actually is being an urban lower middle class worker informal in, sector informal worker sector, specifically urban worker. Yeah. i mean that has been like the worst i mean you know the there is virtually no job insurance there is food price spikes hit them the worst because their budgets are predominantly on food yeah and housing and housing and they have no wealth to fall back on these are the groups that have really been hammered you know in this last you know 15 20 years china kind of dealt with it by just preventing people from moving or at least making it more expensive we haven't had that so the price mechanism has completely screwed them i mean you know it may made it really bad for you know these informal urban workers so you know that has to be a key component of spending because otherwise what's going to happen is these guys have nothing to fall back on and you know if they have no way of paying even i mean they need cash so you can give them a little bit of food which is what the main intervention seems to have been but they need cash to pay their rent they need cash to buy things like milk i mean you know there are these roles that the government plays at one is to create a legal and institutional framework within which private sector operates the other is to provide some social insurance and the third is to intervene in public goods yeah. which is a public capital vaccinations uh, yeah. and so, other so such things exactly so the three big things and at this point it seems like two out of those three the institutional structure they've inherited so it's not like anything's been built 
But, you know, the other two have just been rendered completely moribund. Even neither, I mean, there was in the lead up to the previous national election, there seemed to have been a fair bit of welfare spending. So there, were, there was some targeted spending over there. But I think a lot of that was funded on cheap oil prices and the excise. Now, we are neither spending on, on welfare programs, nor are we building public capital, which is like the worst of all words, as, as you rightly said. The only way to spark demand right now is to actually create some cash transfers. Now, you know, there is this bit of what's going to spark demand for goods that are being sold by the urban informal sector through some part of the supply chain, which is being demanded by the upper, the higher income white collar guys. A lot of that spending somehow, I think maybe this is why one of my suggestions was to cut the GST rate on consumer durables, you know, temporarily, make it seem like it's a temporary cut. That might jumpstart some spending on, in that sector. So you kind of think outside the box, make it incentive compatible for people to ramp up demand on things that the herbal informal worker is somehow involved in, either in direct production or in the supply chain of it, which is going to, you know, spark this increase. But it requires some fiscal spending going on. It's not going to come out of cutting repo rates anymore. I want to go into big picture for a minute. So what is the way India should think about getting back on the old growth trajectory? You know, the one that it enjoyed from, say, 1991 to almost 2014, you know, that was like a really nice run you know, high growth rates, a lot of confidence in the economy, though after 2010, it started faltering a little bit. But, you know, how do you get back to that part of the Indian economic story? You know, the uh, the unsaid part of your question is, you know, the growth trajectory began slowing down, maybe 2000, you know, 10 to 2012, 13, it had slowed down. And then it, it actually did recover till about 2015, 16. And then since then, it's been a secular decline in growth rates uh, since then. You know, to answer your question, I think it's useful for me to outline my view of what sparked the Indian pickup to start with, and then we can get into what needs to be done to get back on that path. So my take on what what happened in India pre-mid-1980s, I actually think pickup and growth started in mid-1980s, not necessarily early 90s. And a lot of that uh, was sequentially getting rid of frictions that prevented factors from moving to their highest returns. So that's about labor, that's about capital. The more uh, the frictions, we had set up an economy with a labyrinth of such uh, restrictions that people and capital couldn't really move to sectors where, or to areas where, you know, their returns, their particular own returns were the highest. And this is hugely problematic in a lot of modern economic, or the way of modern economic organization is about people making decisions under uncertainty. I mean, you know, that I don't know, I mean, I'm truly supposed to be a baseball player, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be, you know, an artist or I'm supposed to be an engineer. So we make decisions, some which we are forced to make early, others we make decisions later on. Same with capital that, you know, somebody has some investable funds says, okay, I'm going to set up a textile firm or I'm going to, uh, maybe I'm going to set up a, you know, hotel or a restaurant. Some work out, some don't. So what has to happen at that point is that people need second chances, that, you know, it's not like I'm doomed by some decision I made at the age of 18 or at some point I'm, then I'm stuck with it. And so all healthy economies have churn where people and resources are constantly re-optimizing and you know, reorganizing themselves. That was the major problem with the Indian economy up until the early 90s is the very apocalyptic sort of separation point. But as I said, in the mid 80s, we had another round of that. And what it started doing was this removing restrictions on flow of factors and people. And so what ended up happening, if you just want a very sort of caricatured view of the Indian economy post 1990s, it was literally like uh, we had lots of capital and labor, you know, scattered all across the economy, but mismatched. You know, a guy who was an en supposed to be an engineer was working as a banker, another was work. Same with capital, we just misallocated. And then the reforms allowed these guys to resort. So there was a huge amount of resorting that happened. And so once you resort, you're going to get capital to its optimal use. So you see, you know, higher output, but it comes due to higher productivity, which is sparked by this, you know, removing uh, restrictions. And so that, of course, takes time. I mean, you know, it's not like we gradually did this and people started reorganizing themselves based on the new incentives that they saw. 
And so this gave us a 20 year run of gradually higher you know, growth rates. But resorting is like, at some level, it's like a one shot game. Because you've sort of said, okay, I mean, if I could just do this all in one year, you would have seen the entire gains in one year and that would have been the end of that. And then the music stops yeah. at some point. And incidentally, in our case, the right. music stopped around 2010 or so. Exactly. Uh, yeah. At some level, one could see that as like the end of pretty much what gains there were to be had from this reorganization. And so this is when we now have been like desperately crying out for a second generation of reforms. So now when you think about what is needed, at some level, that doesn't cost fiscal spending. It costs political capital because what is required is, you know, the three big factors of production are capital, you know, labor and land. I mean, you know, and we have massive frictions in all three. You've talked about the banking stuff, you know, a little bit, which is the major way in which capital gets invested in India, you know, through banks. That's the major intermediary. And we have massive frictions there. I mean, you know, in terms of the way we've set it up. Even in, in a non-bank capital intermediation, there are all kinds of frictions about what can be done. So the capital markets are limited in their ambits. India's stock market capitalization is anyway pretty low. So we are not really busting the doors on that. Labor markets, everybody's been talking about it for a long time. This government responded. But the big part of the reforms is collecting 19 codes into four. It's not like getting rid of the codes. They've streamlined it. They haven't reformed it. It's like a great packaging, but uh, it's not really any deep labor market reform. Some minor ones, about 300 to 100. I mean, I'll agree to that, but it's nowhere close to what is needed. And then the third one, which is what I was, the regulatory structure underpinning land is a complete mess. I mean, the UPA government made a complete hash of it got justly criticized for it, saying that these guys completely dropped the ball. But we've seen no movement on that either. So, And those are the three main factors of production. So if you have major frictions in the three main things that are needed to produce for any business or commercial entity, where is the growth going to come from? So in some sense, it's not a big surprise that we went from 3.5% growth at some point overshot and when we're growing at 7 to 8 but the fact that it's going to settle once the, all the transitional stuff is gone, 5% sounds about right. This is what we kind of got as a you know, long run payoff to uh, the change in you know, a regulatory environment. But that's where we're going to go. And I had a, you know, at, at some point, there was nothing to do. I was just doing some baseline fiddling on uh, if we grow, keep growing at 5%, how long would it take for us to just uh, you know, catch up to Greece if Greece didn't move at all? And that's like 2000, you know, 60, 2000. So it's ridiculous, you know, when you have these kinds of massive gaps, you know, a one percentage point decrease in the growth rate has a huge effect, like a massive chunk of humanity residing in a pretty small space of land. So I think the human aspect of this is huge, of dropping the ball on the growth theory, which really needs this second generation of reforms. I agree that there was always an expiration date to the, the transitional part and without a second and third stage of reforms, the party was going to end at some point. But I still feel like it might have ended a little bit prematurely because of some very poor decisions and a lot of regime uncertainty. This starts with some things going back more than a decade, like, you know, retroactive taxation on foreign entities. I mean, this is all, you know, the UPA government's doing. We have some massive regime uncertainty, of course, created under the Modi administration. Demonetization, you know, is a big one. The way GST was designed and executed, you know, you don't know what rates are going to apply to you. You don't know if the system works. You don't know how many filings you need to make. And it's taking three, four, five years to sort it out, which is a fairly long period of time. When you think of a reform, it's a very short period of time. But in the life cycle of a business, which is trying to earn a profit and stay afloat, it's a fairly long period of time. Most small businesses don't have two to three years worth of, you know, uh, working capital to get through hard times, right? And now, of course, you know, this new forms of regime uncertainty, right? Are we, are we going to vaccinate? Are we not going to vaccinate? Are we paying for it? Are we not paying for it? 
like i i think we don't take regime uncertainty as seriously in india as we should probably because we're just so used to the government being so fickle in its decision making that maybe as indians we're just very accustomed to, to this kind of treatment but it has this enormous impact on how people decide to earn and spend their money i mean of course it's career choices like you already mentioned before it's the choice whether you borrow and invest in something right am i going to expand my little store or not am i going to expand my cottage industry or not am i going to switch to a different kind of fertilizer if the subsidy is going to end like it's just never ending the downstream consequences of regime uncertainty I know it's everywhere but like what do you think is the genuine cost of this kind of governance system we have in India I completely agree with you that everything I said earlier was if you knew what was going on this was going to run out anyway uh, and actually there's a fair bit of work on this on quantifying the the role of uncertainty in economic activity and how big uh, is known as uncertainty shocks I mean so in the macro literature in the west people have been trying to measure these things and assess the effect of it on overall economic growth and uh, business cycle fluctuations and can this generate slowdowns of its own that uh, an uncertainty shock and the answer is you can get significant slowdowns just through uncertainty shocks so it's no surprise i mean and and the kinds of shocks that tend to hit western countries where this work is going on is of a far lower order of magnitude than the ones that you were flagging for india where we don't even know if we're going to have some very basic things uh you know the, operating the same way in a year's time relative to now so where does that come from i guess is a deeper question that why is policy making so much more uncertain in countries like ours relative to the west maybe there is a some political economy to it you know because i think i haven't thought about it much till you brought it up in this context but i think we do tend to lurch a lot between politically between this desire for reform and a desire for welfare schemes because people kind of view life as a constant call as as policy makers as a constant call as a constant choice between trade off between inequality and growth the fact that growth by itself might reduce inequality doesn't seem to be a big part of the so what ends up happening is this constant swaying uh, whether it's somebody saying suit boot ki sarkar and then you kind of go into this uh, thing of i'm going to you know ramp up on welfare spending as much as i can in order to establish my credentials and then comes this other thing that suddenly somebody says oh no 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 we've gone too far and so now we need to spark that is essentially the epitome of all kinds of uncertainty because as a potential capital owner who's thinking about investing money you have a time horizon of 10 to 15 to 20 years that's what you're looking at any sort of business potential which is going to have any longevity i mean anything below 10 years seems like a rather short horizon but it's almost impossible to plan the second part of that is related to you know this desperate search for revenues which is again related to uh, the lack of fiscal space so you know retrospective taxation i still actually don't know what the initiative was for or what the thinking was behind demonetization i'm just completely flummoxed by it i mean you know i have no i have no rational explanation for it other than that it was somebody's uh, whim or because it just doesn't line up the retroactive taxation had at least this you know i can see that there was a revenue you know a, a desperate thirst for revenue where can i find some funds and so here here i see something here that i can kind of grab so it's very short term kind of view capital is way more mobile than labor is and so somehow both policy makers and trade unions traditionally tended to forget that though i can see the reason for some of these things that you talked about but the demonetization i don't have any but the deeper i think overarching backdrop to this is you know this policy yo-yoing between these two uh, goals of inequality and but never viewing them as being jointly determined in some sense and that i think is a more fundamental problem and maybe this is where more research based policy making as opposed to policy making based on whims and fancies might be uh, or just polling people i mean do you have policy makers or politicians with a longer horizon or not so i mean i kind of get it that the political economy constraint implies that people will be making more short term calls based on what the next electoral cycle is and so that i think is always going to be true and so but i refuse to say therefore that you know the solution is that we need to get away from a much more democratic structure into a world where you can have some benevolent dictator because the probability of getting a benevolent dictator is so low 
based yeah, on there's only of, one <laughs> <laughs> when i give uh, that lecture i always put lee kwan news picture i'm like we've only found one so far we're searching for the next it's not been very fruitful so yeah it's exactly i mean you can you can kind of say that maybe deng was another one that maybe the other example where somehow china got blessed for you know for they had a 20 year run based on one man who had a big thing but to put your eggs into a basket which has such low supply of good eggs it just seems like a crazy model to follow again i want to unpack a couple of things so first i want to start with i think there's a further issue in the political economy of decision making i think one is you know the socialist past economic decisions are highly centralized the way we make them in india you know it's not the kind of independent institutions and the back and forth between these independent institutions which gives a lot of stability to policy making it's a lot of economic policy by diktat right which makes sense in a centrally planned economy a centrally planned economy is economic policy by diktat but we never kind of switched out of that in some sense on demonetization though i didn't agree with it that the original goal was a one time windfall where they expected that 30 to 40% of the notes will not come back and it'll you know kind of be a big gain for the government to help it write down its debt with the reserve bank i genuinely think that probably what happened was somebody got sold on a bad bill of goods and that bill of goods would have had a few components to it and each of those components individually might have seemed oh this is probably a good thing i think stuff i'm right over the succeeding one week i had lots of exchanges with people involved in policy making at the time who wanted an assessment of what the numbers would be and the thinking there was basically what you were saying that you know 50% was not going to come back of the demonetized bills notes and so that's the you know overall revenue gain and so on that thinking clearly had a lot of buy in yeah had had a lot of buy in precisely because they thought okay this is cheap money i can just get it without thinking through all the disruption i mean even forgetting about the even if that were true just because there are gains potentially and i'm not saying these are net gains that there are no costs yeah you and i are early critics of demonetization because we both felt like you can't count benefits without yeah, counting without the, the costs cost. it's crazy i mean you know that so even if i buy into that argument i just don't see the logic for it because you have to then ask what you're giving up in the process on top of that i mean there is this notion that somehow people who are and this comes i think from people having consumed too many movies from the 50s and 60s where the bad guys is sitting with cash so it's only the very low level businessman who's carrying around big quantities of cash i mean the cash component gets switched into assets non cash assets very very quickly and that is the big thing of somehow figuring out a way of converting up uh, or money laundering or whatever you want to call it but nobody's sitting i mean if you have big money you're not sitting on cash except if you're a political party which is the other so and they were exempt and they were exempt so but of course they rely on donations from various so business keeps aside cash a lot of it around electoral cycles pretty much all big businesses will keep aside because they know the grim reaper is going to be knocking at the door for funds as you can see the situation with this ex minister deshmukh in and he would say why single me out i mean you know everybody is doing this so that's the second bit of what this uh, bill of goods might have had which is the yeah, an electoral consideration and what this is going to do potentially to electoral fortunes of one party versus the other so that might have had something to do with it because there were elections around the corner and the third one was i think just this notion that somehow this is going to politically look very good because i'm going after the rich folks yeah the yeah. and so i think that clearly did succeed because despite all of the pain and everything else there was the sense that people seemingly thought we're all in this fight together this is why i think this government is very good at simple political economy calculations because even if it fails on all the other margins you know you can build personal heft if you are viewed as someone who is willing to suffer costs for the greater good and potentially saying that look I mean, this is a guy who realized you know he took this big risk to trying to clean things up and that narrative you can kind of spin it because you know i can imagine uh, the spin would be that 
look, I mean, I know that people would be possibly very angry with me for all this cost, but, you know, this had to be done. That kind of political thinking is somewhat rare. Yeah, and also the asceticism, right? Like the idea that he's not personally profiting from it. Unlike most politicians, his children and grandchildren and, you know, sons and daughters-in-law are not amassing massive sums of wealth. He's relatively frugal personally, and that really builds into this typical caricature of a politician that all of us deal with who are just, you know. just not, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's very different in in that sense. And I think this just also built this thing that, you know, I think it does look, all decisions we make, there are some potential gains and there are costs. And so when there is a move that is made, which potentially has huge costs or it ended up having huge costs, you can imagine, you know, a narrative gaining ground saying that the guy didn't care. I mean, what the cost potentially he might face, but he's so, you know, set on trying to clean things up. So, you know, in your paper, you talk about how the demonetization policy didn't quite realize the intended benefits, right? So whether it's cleaning up black money, which it didn't because most of the holdings are not in cash and anyway, it's not a stock, but a flow and so on. There was never much counterfeiting to begin with in the first place. So that was kind of like a red herring, right? Because, you know, there's also this drift, like mission drift, You know, it starts out with black money, it ends up with digitization. So this whole moving towards digital currencies also, you know, there's a spike quickly. Everyone switches to Paytm for a short period of time and things like that. And then, you know, it just comes back to trend very, very quickly. So the benefits were clearly not realized. At the time when you wrote the paper, you said it's still too early to talk meaningfully about the kind of costs, right? So there is a short term shock, but the long term costs of demonetization are not yet clear. Do you have a better sense now or is it now completely clouded by other kinds of things that have happened since, such as GST and, you know, the pandemic and the lockdown? Will we ever really know the true cost of demonetization? It's an excellent question. I don't know. It's going to be extremely hard because my initial thinking was that, I mean, the GST thing was already confusing things a little bit. So, you know, even absent COVID, I mean, it was going to be hard to disentangle the two things because... Both of them had this massive disproportionate effect on the informal economy, which is very more cash driven and by nature of being informal was not part of this whole tax structure. So both shocks have hit those sectors. The reason I was concerned from the perspective of demonetization as to what it might do in terms of long run shocks was I could see two effects. It probably was going to disrupt the supply chains a lot. I mean, you know, in the short run, because it made a lot of these informal suppliers, you know, essentially go out of business because if they couldn't receive cash payments, they couldn't pay salaries. And the guys who were, you know, relying on making cash payments to them were just not making them. And so that I thought potentially could lead to a big dying out of firms that just, you know, these informal firms which just didn't have the sustaining capacity to be able to live through a shock like that. That in turn would spill down the chain to everybody who worked because they are also in this business of outsourcing a bunch of the contracts they get to completely mom and pop enterprises operating out of their, you know, one room tenements and so on. So I thought that was the big negative thing. On the other hand, you could potentially see that it might lead to an expansion or, you know, some sort of vertical integration where you would see some of the bigger firms integrating by expanding their upstream production lines uh, as opposed to just relying on sourcing. What that would do to productivity, uh, you know, is an open question. So there were lots of uncertainty. I mean, in a very pure lab experiment, there are stories of either way it might a greater upstream integration, vertical integration could generate certain gains because you have some contracting gains, you have, you know, you're getting rid of hold up problems, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, you potentially are losing certain gains from specialization that you might get. That's how the world has organized clearly through much more specialization and linkages. So it's not clear which direction this thing might go. But then on top of that, you throw in GST. And now with COVID, again, it's like completely decimated that entire informal sector. So, I mean, it has to be somebody very clever will be able to figure something out through looking at some natural experiment where at least one or both of, you know, one of these was very limited in its impact and the other one did show up and compare across geographic regions or something like that. So 
See, the demonetization, at least you can find some variation across regions simply because of penetration of cash by, you know, where was the shock? So you can kind of do a little bit. The GST is much harder. COVID, maybe there is, uh, but, you know, it's like you can imagine drawing a Venn diagram. Uh, what is the overlay between the GST shock, the COVID shock, and the demonetization shock? And it's likely going to be finding spaces where only one hit and the other two didn't hit. But, you know, even there, given how integrated the economy is, it's really tough. Now, let's say people in typically like big cash businesses, like, you know, the farmers who would take like gunny sacks full of cash to go and buy a new tractor, right? That's your typical cash economy we're talking about because of demonetization, because now there's this big imposition on cash and they had to go deposit everything and it takes a while to sort it out. The tractor company, which is completely formal, and has nothing to do with this side of the economy, right, in some sense. And it's probably in like an industrial part of the country somewhere, maybe, you know, Sri Paramadur corridor or something, where the cash penetration is pretty high, is still going to feel a hit, right? I can't think of an easy geographical diff and diff when it comes to a problem like this, which is the economy being integrated across so many linkages that, you know, I mean, if you really take the economy seriously, not as a monolith, but like a huge effort of coordination and cooperation, I think it becomes very difficult to separate this stuff. I'm very distressed about this because I wanted some like nail in the coffin kind of evidence (laughs) to show that demonetization was a terrible idea. You know, any government in the future should tread carefully and never get into this. And now it's just been completely overshadowed by other blunders. Yeah, no. So, I mean, it's it's exactly like we are are moving from one catastrophe to the next, which is dimming the memory of the previous bad shock. Even in one's mind, now demonetization seems like, you know, Oh, whatever. It was so far back. The same with GST. I mean, I, you know, this GST thing, I mean, was so massive in terms of its effects. It was so poorly designed. That by itself would cut the legs off any economy that is relying 60% on the informal sector for sustenance. You know, I have an example of a friend of mine who's part of the Indian cricket management hierarchy. And he, because he's getting paid, you know, he's a service consultant. Whatever he does, I mean, he had to file 12 monthly returns, four quarterly returns and one annual return. So he's 15. I have to do the same thing because I teach in India. And I get paid maybe twice. And then imagine I'm sitting over here and figured out an ecosystem where it works relatively seamlessly. That after taking six months to figure out that ecosystem. But imagine some person working in, you know, having this kind of outlet in Dadri or, you know, even further more remote uh, parts of India. Just the uh, internet connections are so spotty. The system's down half the time. The small firm in Dadri has two problems. One, it's not easy to file. But until you file, you also can't get your input credit back, which means double whammy. Right now, all your working capital is completely tied up with the state. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then on top of that, you know, the average rate that was devised with the state was going to be in a revenue deficit just by construction. So now you've got this odd situation where you like we're going to have an 18 percent average rate when the previous system was averaging about 27 to 28 percent. So, you know, you could have created three, four, you might have created three, four less, but then you've got an average rate, which is basically structured, centered at a revenue deficit point. And so now you've got the states have, on top of that, the states have handed off all of their, you know, revenue independence. So now the center has, they have to fill up the coffers, they have these deficits, so the cesses they don't have to share. So it's like a mad mess of frictions up and down the state's are not getting what they're due. Yeah, they were in constitutional default for three months, right? Not paying the states. But, you know, I think this again goes back to your previous point that, you know, there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of the economy, right? This whole growth versus inequality or what does economic growth really do? Now, at the current rate of growth in the economy, an 18% or a 15% rate is most likely going to be a revenue deficit. But the entire point of the GST was that if we can move to a single rate, which is incentive compatible, the size of the market is going to get bigger. There is going to be greater economic activity. And given three to four years after the adjustment takes place, actually, you're not just going to be revenue neutral, you're going to increase revenues, right? So 
I recently wrote a paper I think it's going to come out in uh, social philosophy and policy so originally the GST trade off was we can't have an 18% rate because the person who buys the BMW and the person who buys like the t-shirt right or the parlay ji biscuit is going to have the same rates and that's completely unfair so you know that's regressive so because we want to avoid regressive consumption taxes we're going to have this rate proliferation right so we ended up having five rates then now we have seven non zero rates 12 if you include cesses and so on and so forth but the part that the government forgot about is that the more rates you have the more regressive it is for on the production side because given a certain amount of compliance cost you know the small tenement shop in a slum in dharavi suddenly these guys need to get chartered accountants they need to you know have a firm they need to get someone who's internet savvy so the cost of compliance is so high for the smaller firm that now it's regressive on the production side and that completely devastates the informal economy right so again there seems to be a very like a big misunderstanding by the way and we are still at a point where parley ji is at 18% gst tax right whereas tanish ki is at below 1% so we haven't even got the regressive inequality part of it right figure out yeah correct right? absolutely so absolutely. we've kind of messed it up on every single margin but i think it still comes from this fundamental misunderstanding of exactly how the market works right how incentives work and how certain types of costs which are imposed on certain economic activity could have much bigger downstream effects than just having something which is much simpler which may not seem that fair but in the end it's going to increase the level for everyone right i think you're absolutely right i mean you know and and this sort of connects with this peeve of mine that i've had a long time that you know this suspicion of markets in india is so endemic amongst policy makers and and this is why i was alluding to people having watched too many bad uh, movies from the 50s and 60s where that was the basic narrative right i mean that the capital whether it was the shopkeeper or the capital owner or the in- industrialist were all exploitative human beings who just valued exploitation above all the fact that there can be a confluence of interests between capital owners and uh, and employers and employees depending on how their joint output is going that doesn't seem to have figured and this by the way is true not just amongst policy makers or uh, amongst politicians but also amongst intelligentsia in india i mean you know very left leaning right i mean and incredibly i mean so this whole cash versus transfers whether you want to make it through um the pds system or whether you want to make it through aadhar or cash transfers you've got like an incredibly strong group and of course there will be examples where you can find that cash transfers were exploited in in jharkhand or you know didn't quite work as well so over in kind frankly yeah. so i mean you know it's it's so it has to be on the balance which method is proving to be less leaky than the other so but it's worse than that you know it's not like they check which side is more leaky it is more that people are willing to live with an enormous amount of error when it comes to the state and there should be no error at all when it comes to the market right yeah that's right the market anyway. better be a zero error bet otherwise we're going to clamp down on it instantly so the market is malified unless proven otherwise like the uh, basic way in which people think and and that shows up in public policy all the time in uh, various diverse things that people do in terms of the regulatory structure and in terms of taxation schemes it just shows up uh, whether it's covid or you know vaccination policies or you know purchasing vaccines it's the same thing markets are just not your friend now it might well be true in certain cases with externalities there are many many examples where unfettered market is not what one is talking about but starting with this prior that the market is your enemy is a very defeatist kind of thing where most indians are essentially involved through extract their lifestyle you know through the market so it's a strange thing of of cutting off your own legs in an economy which and for some reason this narrative has gained so much ground this is once again when you kind of you know, when i talk to my you know you talk to businessmen in india small businessmen not the the big bigger guys they're also incredibly suspicious of uh, whether it's public sector banks versus private sector banks even though we've all uh, you know so they are not I'd rather put my money in a public sector bank I don't trust the private, uh, you know private guys even though they themselves are working so it's like a dissonant space almost like people not trusting themselves is it because during themselves. socialism 
in the mixed economy the only way to operate in the market was by being very corrupt and giving bribes and so on and breaking a hundred rules that now somewhere at the back of your mind that is the version that we have you know because if you start from an enlightenment set of ideas you think the market is wonderful right i mean if you grew up in the united states you don't have this horrible experience in the marketplace right you don't have shortages you don't have clever capitalists trying to bootleg things stolen from russian shops and you know trying to capitalize on people's misery but under socialism everything gets corrupted right even the market gets distorted and really the worst get on top do you think it's that kind of a hangover like it's so bizarre where this comes from it could be i think it has something to do with the only guys who could succeed in the market economy were those who were willing bribing at some level was all about public sector you're trying to bribe some person who is involved in the public sector space is what drove most of that right i mean it was including a, me trying to get a telephone line you know you would have to bribe the lineman to get what you were owed to start with that you're a gas connection again you would have to pay to just hold your line in the queue what does that have to do with the market it's just got to do with the fact that the rules the, the regulatory structure now you know somehow people have conflated that with uh, the market being corrupt is a sort of a meta way of thinking about market saying that the whole corruption world was the market trying to find the right price and therefore i think the market is corrupt we were sold on this notion that somehow big industry in particular was all in the business of exploiting the only ones who seem to have escaped this image is the tatars but other than that that's because they predate the republic i think yeah <laughs> maybe <know? laughs> yeah maybe you know, that they didn't grow during this period but you know this is an endemic view up and down the system that big industry is completely exploited and you know and that is their main goal to exploit even though the fact that the biggest escape out of poverty has happened since 1991 you know in the history of modern india and the biggest regression into poverty has happened through the growth slowdown post covid should kind of make clear that without growth and without uh, without growth you're not going to have any escape from any of this and growth is not going to come out of the state leading you to growth and that's the other part of uh, i think what is sad about india in terms of the way the thinking of the way it operates is you know it seems that everybody's looking for the state looking to the state to solve problems and that is again it's 70 years of being fed this kind of line that this i will take care of you the state is this my bab this is what we're going to do and there's so much focus and the entire attention is what is the government going to do this year what is the government going to do on this how they going to the focus is on the government solving our problems and not getting out of the way instead which is again the enlightenment way of thinking correct and it's been 70 years of proof that the government is not the solution the government is the problem what we have to do is not more government would get the government out of the way as you uh, rightly put it and that doesn't cost any money yeah it costs a lot of political capital that's yeah, hard to come by yeah cost political capital right but it doesn't cost direct so this fiscal stuff that you worry about about reforms etc regulatory reform is actually cheap financially i mean fiscally is cheap politically may be expensive again i mean you know it also shows up in in the attraction of individuals so you know whether we always looking for a the great leader the purushottam who's going to you know lead us to salvation so i guess this moses like you know looking for the next <laughs> moses is it's not just india i mean it's in a lot of places some level i think maybe one should be more you know self effacing and and admit that you know this notion of the democratic structure is being the way to organize life is is a very modern new experiment in the grander scheme of mankind in the history of mankind or any earth based groups which are typically have always been led by one and that seems to be the natural order whether in the animal world of always looking at one leader and we can't have choice by aggregation of views is a relatively new thing and that's why you see you know at the first sign of problems people regressing to yeah. looking for this very centralized solution very centralized yeah so you know i want to talk to you a little bit about liberalization and you know the many things that followed so the first part is inequality right this you know i mean now it's fairly well established that liberalization but we in say the late 80s and for the two two and a half decades that followed india might have lifted anywhere between 250 to 300 million people out of poverty right depending on where you start and when you end 
that's an extraordinary achievement in a fairly short period of time so the idea that liberalization has increased the income levels generally of everyone seems to i think have a lot of buy in the typical sort of accusation against it is it's increased inequality so first of all where are we on increase in income levels across all the different groups in india and where are we on increases in inequality so there are two aspects to inequality i mean you know so one can do it as you can divide up a country into or any society into constituent groups with some identified a well well defined markers so in india it could be caste it could be geography it could be gender you could do it on on multiple margins and so what you find is if you you know when you look at inequality based on inequality across groups or between groups if you will those things seem to have shrunk so whether it's rural urban inequality or whether it's caste based inequality at least at the broader level i mean you know as scheduled scheduled caste and tribes versus non scheduled caste and tribes those gaps seem to have shrunk it's also showing up in faster paces of intergenerational mobility amongst some of the relatively economically you know backward castes or you know economically backward regions catching up towards so there is fair bit of evidence that that has happened over the last 30 years we've seen you know big gender gaps have actually been decreasing as well quite rapidly the other aspect of inequality is within group inequality do you see people within you know rural areas has inequality uh, what has happened to that within urban areas within uh, castes uh, within gender by census there is evidence that within group inequality has widened but that by itself shouldn't be that surprising that you know you're going to find a within group some winner some losers that's exactly how merit based systems should be working that you know we are not all identically endowed in everything and so if that were the case then of course you know differences in outcomes would be completely random and then uh, would tend to reverse themselves but in as much as a market system as a you know a merit based system is rewarding people for their ability so you should see within group inequality widening as you move more and more towards market based outcomes i mean that you're not trying to manage outcomes you're sort of outsourcing that to the market but you should also see a cross group between so that because unless you believe that groups by themselves are differently endowed then you find this as long as groups are not differently endowed on average any gaps are evidence of some pre-existing distortion in the system and so what we have seen in india is those gaps decreasing but within group disparities potentially widening and so it's important any time there's inequality discussions to care keep these two different aspects of it in mind and somehow you know it often gets conflated the two but i think it's important to dis- to distinguish between those two things and you know i think another very uplifting thing in the empirical evidence as you point out is that historically the poorest groups who were also the most oppressed right this is the dalits and the adivasis so two things seem to be happening one is their overall socio economic level has increased right and the second is intergenerational mobility within these groups and families have actually you know shown upward mobility right so the children of dalits are more likely to deviate from the caste ordained occupation and most likely to take on a more lucrative job now of course it's it need not be like it's not like oh they're all suddenly rich right but they are more likely to have this kind of upward social mobility and this is work that you've done with uh, Saurabh Paul and Victoria Natkovska so now how much of this is because of affirmative action programs and this huge push towards you know constitutional equality and reservations and how much of it is because of markets is there a way to disentangle that people try different things i'll tell you about i mean i just finished a, a paper on this topic trying to understand this decouple these two these two effects growth and affirmative action on outcomes what we seem to be finding is that i mean of course the way we do this is by looking at it through the lens of a model do the identification so the idea in the paper is let's write down a model a structure with which we look at the structure will generate gaps between groups and we try to you know rig the model such that the, it gets the gaps between groups exactly right for 1983 and then we hold those gaps you know the the rigging kind of constant just hold the calibration parameters constant and then we hit it the model with just growth the growth that we actually saw between 1983 and 2012 that's the 
period we have. And then ask, what does that growth do to intergroup inequality? What is the predicted inequality in 2012 and how well do we match that with the actual gaps we saw in the data in 2012? And what we find is that growth alone can ex- explain upwards of 80, 80% of the overall the, of the shrinking in the wage gap. How important is affirmative action? Clearly, affirmative action, so in our structure, affirmative action has two parts to it. One is the education component, and then there is the job reservations in the public sector. Now, public sector employment is a very small fraction of Indian employment. If you just add everything up, including the states, and it's a very, very small part of overall Indian, you know, which is Indian the Indian workforce is close to about 650, 700 million people. Public sector employment is about close to, say, 20. It's not more than that. If you Once you add up, you know, everything, even across states, I mean, at the federal level, it's much lower. So the big part of Indian employment is actually outside in the public sector space. But education, higher education does matter. Once you start thinking of the economy as a layered structure where people can work with almost no training in agriculture, with very minimal training, then to access some employment, employment in very baseline manufacturing, you need greater skills. You at least need to be able to follow instructions, maybe read some written instructions. You go a bit more up the the technical ladder, you need some polytechnic-based competence or some technical education you need. And then to move up into the white-collar service sector, you need more and so on. So that's the kind of structure we have in the model. So education, you know, reservations do matter for transiting out from untrained agriculture towards more trained uh, vocations. So that's where these reservations might be important. So, of course, we keep the reservations constant because reservations at an overall overall sense haven't really changed based on, you know, what we had. We've continued having since the early 50s. We've kind of had that in place. The only thing we've done is we've kind of expanded OBC reservations, which really helps the others, you know, not the SCSTs. But in spite of that, we see this So I guess what we find is that, you know, if you removed reservations in education, you would see an impact on the wage gaps. The wage gaps would actually widen, would worsen, but it's more like a static effect. In terms of the dynamic effect of growth, you would have seen a convergence, pretty sharp convergence uh, between groups with or without reservations. All that the reservations do is in some sense move the whole wage gap, the level effect, Affirmative action is almost like a level effect as we have it in the model. We don't know whether that's the right model, but at least from the lens of that model, it's a level effect. So the growth part, you know, it just keeps going down at the same rate, except both the starting and the end points come down if you have reservations. If you don't have reservations, both the starting and the end points go up. But then the dynamic effect is all from growth. So and that's the sense in which we think that growth basically lifted all boats in the Indian context. And that's the dynamic effect. That said, one might think in a more long-run structure, you could have this you know, propagation coming from affirmative action, which can have dynamic effects, because it might change the initial distribution of endowments. Because in as much as you know, we are kids of people who went to college, you know, the human capital we are getting just from the nurturing component starts transmitting itself or propagating itself. So as, as time goes on, as uh, more and more people from, you know, SCSTs, those b- backgrounds are getting educated, they're going to be passing on that inbuilt knowledge to their kids. So it generates, uh, I think, a better distribu- initial distribution, which is a mechanism we don't have in the model. But yeah, but it's important. It's an important mechanism. I see that as a more long run thing, not in a 20 year period. You don't, you're unlikely to see big changes coming from that margin. On job reservation, do you think there's a pull effect? I know it's a fraction of the jobs in the economy, but there is such a rat race to get one of those jobs. It's such a prized thing to get a government job, reserved or otherwise, that people make massive investments in human capital to get that job. And it's not like that human capital dies if they don't get the job, right? They can take it somewhere. No, I agree with you. One should always be a bit skeptical of using just baseline proportions to make arguments because, I mean, you know, sometimes people also make these arguments that trade doesn't really matter for the U.S. because just 1% of overall the U.S. economy is trade. But it doesn't really matter. In that sense, it's true that it doesn't matter whether because pricing is always at the margin. So as long as there is this open fringe, it's going to create that marginal guy is going to start pulling all prices. So I, I totally hear you there, that it certainly probably has an effect of people 
But the only thing I would say on that is that that mechanism has been there since the mid 50s. Yeah, so it shouldn't suddenly spike after 83, 85. Exactly. So what we have seen is a, this dramatic change after the 1990s. The thing that really changed was growth. And so this is where, I mean, you see this effect all across India, across groups. You know, exactly this thing that you're mentioning that parents working incredibly hard to invest in their kids through sending them to whatever ramshackle structure that is promising english medium education for their kids in a one room thing uh, where some guy comes in and they think that that's their ticket up that there's some sort of urban employment for their kids which might be facilitated by them knowing a little bit of english whether that's being a driver or you know it's just some some low level office employee in one of these big urban centers and so on and that has been the big driver the thinking that those are the jobs that are opening up not so much the public sector job. at least that's my take on it because the public sector employment bit has not changed what about like say a group like muslims right so there are some papers on this like you know paul novosad and sam asher have written their conclusions are very much in line with yours on the upward social mobility in dalit and adivasi groups but they find that actually that benefit is entirely offset by the lack of mobility among muslims right so what do you think is driving some of that now one possibility is if the growth is really being driven by affirmative action then of course the muslims are traditionally excluded from it because it's caste based and not religion based but if it is mostly market driven right then what is going on with this particular socio economic group so is it sort of like one of those you know timor koran long run divergence explanations where institutions of lending financial intermediation how they hold assets how they invest capital as a structure among islamic groups is not letting them participate in markets as effectively right or is it regime uncertainty because of discrimination is it access to education like there must be something going on that one particular group doesn't see the same kind of upward social mobility yeah i mean my take is it's less to do with affirmative action and there's more to do with these other factors that you mentioned first up muslims were doing much better than scst up until uh, the early 80s they were doing much better so one way to focus on this is to say that okay i'm going to start looking at all religious minorities and because if it's affirmative action based you should see scsts doing better than christians doing better than buddhists doing better than jains doing better than muslims there's no reason to single out muslims as the only minority that somehow this affirmative action has messed with them whereas it doesn't seem to have done absent that kind of study i'm you know i'm not completely convinced that it's the affirmative action is the story that is potentially explaining what's happened to muslims i mean there are these numbers issues but exactly the argument that you made earlier i'm not directly persuaded by numbers however i mean i think the regime uncertainty might have a lot to do with it but more than that i worry uh, you know about the fact that there exists a parallel institutionalized education delivery mechanism for certain groups the muslims in particular have what that has done whether that curricula has been evolving uh, to be consistent with you know modern market needs or not i'm not sure what these madrasas are teaching i think this requires a much more in-depth analysis of precisely where do kids from madrasas go are they looking at you know employment in the modern economy or they're looking at employment in very very segmented labor markets why is that are these specific kinds of markets that they look at that suggests more uh, some sort of a social religious issue that is driving choices being made by that group as opposed to your issue of discrimination with the market it may be that is a, there's a push effect that there is a market based discrimination which is generating this it could be a perception based issue but i think it's a much more long running issue than the last 5 years or something but you know even if you don't have discrimination in the market just social discrimination can sometimes nudge you in certain directions so for instance if there is the sense of discrimination or you know some kind of you know unfair treatment of muslims they are more likely for reasons of job security to take traditional employment that their parents might have followed or their kin groups might have followed because that just gives you more certainty than engaging in like manufacturing or you know some big industrial shop floor or something like that so even if firms directly are not discriminating against muslims if the same people outside of hiring decisions are 
then it can create this weird effect. And I don't know if there's something like that going on. Because it seems to have done that when it comes to housing choices, right? Uh, there's been greater in ghettoization of Muslim communities across all incomes, right, in urban areas in a way that wasn't true even 40, 50 years ago. Like, this is a very new urban thing. So I'm wondering if there's a similar effect going on in employment. I mean, maybe an interesting thing to do at some point is the trajectory of Pakistan post-1980, post-Zia, which is when this institutionalized education and, uh, you know, there was a massive focus on religious seminary-based education, which started picking up a lot of Pakistani children from rural bases. How much does that mirror what we have been seeing in India to sort of try to understand? Because that's a case where there is no sort of minority-based persecution or anything. It's just to do with a different view of what... Human capital building. Yeah, a building is supposed to be. And I think that may be the way to sort of look and see if you see different trajectories or something similar happened there as well. Because that, I think, is, is an important question. I mean, you know, I'm personally aware of this urban uh, housing discrimination that leads to ghettoization. By the way, this is just, it's not just religion-based. I mean, you know, my father, many years back, was stationed in Ahmedabad. And so at that time, I used to visit. And he was living in a government accommodation because he was working with one of the central government services. But I had some cousins there as well. And one of the key things that would come out is this housing discrimination based on food habits. So, I mean, where, so if you were a non-vegetarian, you would not, I mean, that's the first question that a homeowner would ask you if you went to rent, that do you eat or not? If not, you go to the Muslim bar, would be the standard thing. So this kind of ghettoization has been there at various levels. It's certainly much more endemic with Muslims, has become much more endemic with them over the last, you know, 20 odd years. I didn't remember hearing so much of it up until, uh, you know, the mid 90s. But after that, you know, one is hearing much more. Uh, post Babri, that seems to be the break, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the post Babri is the break, which is, you know, this is this thing that suddenly society normalized expressing thoughts which were previously viewed as being non-kosher. Now it's, it's normalized that it's empowered to say whatever you want. And I think that's partly what has happened. So, you know, in one kind of convergence we just talked about is caste groups and, you know, intergenerational mobility. The other question I had is rural urban mobility, right? You already hinted on this earlier when you were talking about the nature of migrants and things like that. It seems like that is shrinking and not so much because the… The gaps are shrinking. And part of it is because the urban incomes in the informal sector are not as high as we had hoped. And second, that the rural areas are transforming into non-agrarian parts, but they're still rural or semi-urban or peri-urban, like whatever they're calling it these days, right? So they're moving out of agriculture, which we know has been declining in productivity, but they are not yet moving to urban areas. And a lot of rural areas are actually doing quite well in non-agrarian activities. Is that a good way of thinking about this convergence? Yeah, it is. One of the ways in which we traditionally think about rural-urban is that rural is agriculture, urban is uh, non-agriculture. And that, I think, is an oversimplification. And, and it's not just in India. I mean, I think this is true of, you know, patterns of structural transformation that have happened, even in the West, that rural areas tend to reinvent themselves as they go along. So as structural transformation happens with agriculture beginning to shrink, People have to re-optimize, so they need to find ways of accessing jobs in the expanding non-agricultural sectors, which often tend to be, which are mostly, you know, non-rural, which are urban. And so as a result, so the traditional models like of this, like the Harris Todaro kinds of models were written based on this difference between urban and rural. But rural areas in response, some people clearly move to urban areas and try to find jobs in these expanding non-agricultural jobs in urban areas. But rural areas begin to reinvent themselves as well. Clearly, once you start looking at areas in the West, say, look at the US, look at Europe. Traditional villages, it's hard to tell. There are villages, I mean, in the US, we don't talk about places as being villages, but in Europe, people talk about villages. Yeah, I mean, you know, there'll be guys who are working in the IT sector who'll tell you that he lives in a village in the outskirts of Berlin or, you know. So the village culture is very alive, but the village is not agriculture. Villages, so it didn't happen overnight. It happened gradually along the process of structural transformation. So India is no exception. 
The only thing is, and I think this might might have happened in the West as well, that the way typically when structural transformation happens, there are requirements for greater connectivity across regions, across cities. The transportation network expands very sharply. So you have highway systems being laid down, possibly increasing train connections being laid down. So a lot of the newer activities that rural areas come up with are centered around the commerce abutting these newer highways, etc. And that's where you see this big churn happening. People quitting agriculture and going into these, you know, roadside uh, restaurants, roadside small mechanic shops, you know, tire outlets and so on and so forth. So this tremendous amount of entrepreneurship that exists in India as opposed to this notion that somehow we're just a job-seeking group, but that's not what it is. You know, 90% of Indian service sector employment is actually his own account enterprises, which is uh, bomb and pop shops, where it's one guy with his wife or maybe a kid, and they run the whole thing. And that's entrepreneurship in India, and that's how rural areas in India have been reinventing themselves. And so a big component of the rural pickup is actually expansion on those non-agricultural things. Does this mean that India can somehow get out and have this great structural transformation without urbanizing and without manufacturing, which have traditionally been the ways by which countries get out of that, you know, poverty trap and and go into the, you know, middle to high income. Is this a way out or will this also hit some kind of ceiling very quickly when these mom and pop stores can't scale and when everything has been reorganized and the music stops? Uh, no, I, th- I don't think, you know, that there is any escape from manufacturing. You know, the flip side of, you know, having 90% of service sector employment in own account enterprises is that these are by themselves not high growth, high productivity. I mean, you know, you can just do so much selling bananas and peanuts and it's not going to be a big growth sector. So our view of services as being the driver of growth is really a three-city-based narrative based on, you know, Bangalore, Bombay, Delhi, maybe some Hyderabad, and that's the majority. So it's very high value added, but very low employment relative to the scale of the economy. So that's not where you're you're putting out a million people a month. They can't absorb them. It's not going to be. It's futile for some person who's educated till grade 10 or grade 8 to expect employment in Infosys. He has to be aspiring for a job as like a op- machine operator. And, you know, that's what his skill set is going to allow him to do, the best that it can allow him to do. So, you know, there's a mismatch if you somehow say that a service sector is going to spark our growth. It's not going to spark our growth. It can tide you over in the interim while you're waiting for these. Our only hope is low-tech, large-scale manufacturing. And majority who are young, you know, half of India is below 25. It's frightening. We are looking at the difference between a demographic dividend and a demographic curse. Is we're very, on the brink. It's a very thin line. Yeah, we're on the line. And you can turn into a South Africa very quickly. Gangs of, uh, you know, men, unemployed people walking around cities, you know, with uh, huge issues of security and all the associated manifestations of that. And we are very close to that. I mean, you know, if we are unable to find large-scale employment. You see this happening already in parts. Like Snigda Poonam in her book Dreamers has written about this of how people are aspiring to be Gaurakshaks because it just gives them a certain status in society in a way that they can't get because they have no jobs and they have no future. It's terrifying, right? I mean, that is not a job and it's not a good substitute for a job. No, 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 absolutely. And I I agree. I mean, I think the rise of vigilantism and people are just looking for some anchor, some place to kind of feel like they're to validate their self-worth. If the market doesn't provide it, I mean, these are the alternative ways in which you find it. So I can completely see that. It's very scary. It's very scary. And I don't think we are appreciating it enough. And in some sense, I think this spending so much of societal resources on welfare schemes of the types that we did, this was like a one-time bonanza of money that we had uh, because of this drop in oil prices. I'm not sure we spent it in the uh, the optimal way. I mean, I think it was good for the people who benefited from it. And I think, I mean, some of these programs are great. I mean, the Swatch Bharata Vyana, Bharata Vyana, I think was was outstanding. I mean, you know, in terms of at least its conceptualization and, and what it was aiming to do, benefits are massive. 
but some others were not quite as well yeah, thought out. But all your loan forgiveness and fertilizer subsidy and free water and free electricity, I mean, this is this should have ended 20 years ago. There's no way India can afford it. And it's 2% of the GDP almost, all these agricultural subsidies put together in a very unproductive sector. So it's, uh, I mean, the expiration date has come and gone and we're still kind of hanging no, on know. to this and, stuff. And, and the sad part is politics remains like, competitive socialism. That's what Indian politics is. I mean, every electoral cycle is just this. I mean, each party is trying to outdo the other in terms of what amazing thing they're going to deliver. So it's a vicious circle because once you, one guy does it, the other guy, everybody expects it. And so both at the receiving end and at the giving end, and it's just a bad ecosystem to be in. So yeah, so it's, I think, short answer is, I don't think there's any escaping, uh, you know, expansion of low-tech, large-scale manufacturing. Is That is the panacea for a country like ours. If we were a small, uh, you know, country, that would have been something else. But uh, And look at Bangladesh. I mean, just look at Bangladesh, right? That is the model. I mean, very similar people, language, culture. I mean, South Asia, right? So, and was just completely devastated by a civil war and now seems to be on a growth trajectory that can easily outdo India in the coming yeah, decades. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you some questions about yourself. So one is, how did you become an economist? Or if you are named Amartya, is it just like predestined? And <laughs> <laughs> Actually, funnily enough, I was named after him. It's not that common a name, at least in my generation. It's become more common in the generation after mine. In Bengal, in urban Bengal, I think in the 40s, 50s, 60s, there was, you know, it has that feel of uh, what we hear about in France of intellectuals being fettered, being like almost public personas and so on. So Omar Tosen was, I think, very much like that. I mean, you know, he was very renowned in, in terms of his all his achievements, youngest professor ever at Jadapur University. And, you know, people would know in Bengal at that time, that generation of Bengalis, the names of who finished in the top 10 in uh, in high school, who finished in the top 10. So there would be tracking. I mean, you know, so Omar Tosen was like a rock star, just like Levy is a rock star in France, I mean, in, you know, amongst philosophers. But so that's how he was. So I think that's where the name came from. And uh, Were your parents economists or they wanted no, you to become an economist? No, my father was a mathematician. Ah, uh, it was a okay. few years after Sen at, in Presidency College. But I mean, you know, he, another of my uncles was actually a, a cohort of his at, in college of Sen. But my father was, uh, you know, he was, he actually was a college professor for a while, uh, for a couple of years. And then while deciding whether he wanted to go abroad for a PhD or he'd taken the civil services exam as well. So he switched and that's it. He, he quit his academic life about two years after he started it. My mother is, she was a historian initially, but then it was a history major, but then switched to languages, you know, after she had me, I guess she was staying at home for a while. So she finished her MPhil, but she just started a PhD in international relations, but she stopped. And then when, you know, she came back, I was doing a bit. So she found she didn't want to do that anymore. So she switched to languages. So she retired as professor of Italian language and literature in Delhi University some years ago. So, but uh, I, I was named after him. But my choice of economics was a bit more practical. It had nothing to do with great love for the subject or anything, because I, partly because I had barely spent much time studying. Because my first <laughs> choice of careers was actually was cricket. I, I was actually a very active cricketer uh, growing up. So I was playing for my state at every at, at the age limits. I played up to the Delhi under 22 level. So when I was choosing colleges, the big thing was that I needed to do something which would not force me to attend too many classes and yet survive. So that took out the sciences and because, uh, you know, the labs. So that's what my cousin, my father's elder brother's son, uh, he's an economist as well. So Ashok Lahiri. So he's the one who was a great influence. So he said, you know, take up economics. So that's how I got into economics. I, I was playing for my state. I played for Delhi under 15, Delhi under 19, Delhi under 22. You know, I was playing active club cricket and college cricket. I was in St. Stephen's College. I was playing for them. So that was like a full-time thing for me. That was my first goal. Actually, I played as a professional in Bengal in, in the Calcutta League for a season as well. But then I decided after my, as I was finishing my undergrad, I should find a career with a more talk about uncertainty shocks, with less uncertainty about what's going to happen. And so I decided to stop playing cricket. And, and that's when I joined Delhi School of Economics, because at that point, it was like the logical place to go, because I'd just done an undergrad in economics. But the love really came in uh, while in graduate school. When I started my Delhi, I went to Delhi school, it was really learning economics from scratch because I just hadn't paid much attention. I mean, it's one thing, you know, getting through exams, it's quite another to really know the subject. 
So it was literally being thrown into a cauldron, trying to also cover all the stuff that I had not paid any attention to over the previous three years. So those two years, I had great teachers. I mean, I had some great influences, actually, who somehow gave me the sense that I could hack it as an economist. Professor Badul Mukherjee, who was a professor in the Delhi School of Economics, for some reason, I think because he liked cricket or liked sports, so he somehow took a personal uh, liking to me and uh, he was a great influence in me. Another professor, Kaushik Basu, was uh, great. He ended up writing recommendation letters for me as well. But, you know, the two of them were big influences in the sense that somehow I got the sense that they thought that I could hack it, which was a big thing. And then there was the push factor. You talked about the pull and push factor. I mean, there was, a, you know, this was, I'm stalking, I was doing my MA in 1988 to 1990. And at that time, this was pre-reforms. So, you know, the thing was either you then went to one of these IIMs and started, you know, tried to aim for a private sector job or you took the civil services exam. And then, so my mother actually was quite keen on that. I, I take the civil services. I, for some reason, my father was in the civil service. I just didn't want to do that. And so this seemed like the ticket out. Just apply and go outside and then, you know, we'll figure something out. It'll be my ticket, my escape from these two professions that I was, that I was staring at. And so that's why I applied for a PhD program. But then when I came to graduate school, one of the great things that I thought was a major difference between just the education model in India versus the West was this de-emphasizing just rote memory and emphasizing deeper learning about concepts and what exactly is driving things. Make yourself a person who is sitting in this environment you're studying and ask. You know, so that way of thinking was very different. A, it took the stress out of exams. So that was the big thing about once, you know, that stress was gone and I started reading for the sake of reading, just, you know, that's when I think I fell in love with the subject. And who was at Maryland those years? Well, I had two advisors who were both incredibly influential. I mean, and one person who was not on my advisory committee, but again, took a lot of personal interest in me. So the, my two advisors were Alan Drazen. He used to do much more macroeconomics at the time, but has since become a political economy person. He's got a big book and so on. So he was making that transition at the time from macro to political economy. And then Guillermo Calvo, who was, they were my joint supervisors, the two of them, took a lot of interest in what I was doing, gave me incredible access with a lot of warmth to their time. And then there was another gentleman called John Haltimanger, who was, who was in Maryland, who was a macroeconomist. So these were the three sort of people who, you start doing things often because you want to mimic people. And so both Calvo and Drazen had this, something about the way they would present facts or present ideas was a tremendous influence I mean, on, on me that I, th I found that the thing almost cool. That, you know, if one could do something like this and pull it off with, they seem to know a bunch of things, they seem to be able to present things with remarkable clarity and, and always insightful and as role models. I mean, you always need role models, I guess, uh, somewhere along. Good role models to follow and, and sometimes one is just not very lucky in finding them. In fact, when I started my graduate program, I, w I wanted to do theory and micro. Because that's what all Indians did. Yeah, that's what Indians, Indians did. You're one of yeah, the exactly. few in the 90s who went in that direction. You might be the only. <laughs> yeah, so it helped that Maryland at that time didn't have any micro theory people, you know, who were. Shelling hadn't come to Maryland by then? No, I was actually an RA for Shelling. So, so oh. a TA for Shelling. So I actually did spend two years with him uh, very closely. That actually was a remarkable experience. Even when I didn't need to, I would just sit in on, on, on the classes because I always found them incredibly uh, amazing. What I always remember is about Schelling is he would walk into these classes with no notes, no nothing. I mean, actually, all three of these people I mentioned had this unbelievable thing about Schelling, of course, would talk. I mean, he would introduce a topic like, you know, incarceration. I mean, as a public policy, you know, so let's have a discussion about it. And then it would flow. I mean, that's the whole class, 50 minutes or an hour, 15 minutes. And he would just engage in debates with people. You know, the first person that he would call upon to say something and he would take the opposite argument and the thing would just keep flowing. And the whole test would be, I mean, the power of the mind of the man was whether, you know, each interpersonal exchange would, could somebody last three questions or could somebody last four questions before an inconsistency would be pointed out between what the person started off. I mean, just the power of the mind. And so I decided to subject myself to this kind of examination with him uh, when I was coming up with PhD thesis topics. So I twice actually went up to him saying that, could you give me some time? This is what I'm thinking of. Tell me. And so the first time I went to him with something, because this is not an area he directly used to work in. 
I think I lasted four questions and then there was an inconsistency with some line, line of thought I had. The second time I lasted about, you know, the full hour. And I thought, okay, this one probably has some uh, more legs to it. So uh, just an incredible mind, great privilege to, but also a very warm human being on top of that, which is the other memory. But not a theorist theorist, right? No, not at all. I actually never saw him put any uh, equation, no nothing. It's just pure, just logic. But the clarity and the, the acuteness of the logic was just awe-inspiring in terms of how clearly you could think and see. I mean, it was like a chess player. A chess player could see like, you know, six, seven uh, steps ahead as to where it was going. Phenomenal brain. So, uh, yeah, I forgot about Schelling. I mean, I'm glad you, men- you mentioned him. He was a uh, great influence. What is your writing process like? It depends on what I'm doing. I mean, so there's this sort of popular writing stuff. Since I've tried to keep away from writing, you know, syndicated things, which imply trying to produce something every two weeks. At some point, I I was in India for a couple of years in 2017 to 2019. and, And I found myself writing because I was much more in the Indian political space. And then these guys would start reaching out saying, why don't you write another piece? And I found that was not my, you know, I I didn't enjoy that because then it felt like I was forced. It's a job with a deadline. (laughs) Yeah. And often you're forced to write something on things that you either may not feel. It it feels more contrived because you're you're trying to come up with something to write on as opposed to, I really want to write on this. That kind of writing is things that, you know, fester through my head, which, uh, you know, I can be walking or biking or whatever. I mean, it's but when I sit down to write on something that has been playing on my mind, I mean, that can be just a two-hour process and I'll, I'll, I'll write something out. And, but that end product would probably take two hours to write. But there's a lot of this festering in my mind for the previous week while I you know, keep thinking about it. But the actual writing can be uh, very quick at the end. But that's because of this you know, festering time in the head. Academic writing is a bit different because uh, that has become a much more long drawn out process now because there's a data component to it. So this notion of having an idea and then completing a paper involves so many different steps. And economics, uh, professional writing, academic writing has, is now becoming more and more like a factory floor output. Yeah. So And it's because referees are expecting things and the editors respond to the referees. So you've got to respond to both of them. And so what it has meant is idea is just a small component of it. People do much better at this process than I do in terms of publication, so I'm maybe not the best uh, model for this, but you need to have an idea. Then you need to have some preliminary evidence for the idea that you know the idea is motivated by some fact. So you can call these stylized facts or you can call them some motivating facts that say that, okay, here is something intriguing you know, that I want to look at. Then you come up with an implementation of the idea in terms of some sort of a rough model, which will give you some testable hypothesis and so on and so forth. Then you go to, you know, the next stage, which is where you actually take the model and take it to the data. So that's structural implementation of the data, of the model. Uh, That could involve calibrating a model and, and putting, running some exogenous data shocks through the model, or you could be estimating the model in an econometric way. So... Either of them, but that is confronting the model directly with the data. So the model has to then pass the data test. And then you do some counterfactuals on the model to talk about some policy implications once you've done that. But then, uh, you know, there's going to be some key driver or mechanism that you've embedded in the model. Then you need some independent evidence to back up that key driver. Can you find that? So that's like five steps along the way. Even a quick one. I wrote a COVID paper. I thought it was really quick. It took about three or four months to write. But but then by the time the whole process ended, it was still a year. By the, by that was because this journal was looking for COVID papers and so on. So it became the end process got a bit quicker. But otherwise, you're looking at three years. So by the end, by the time some paper gets published, you're so sick of it. I mean, you know, and, and it has become remote in your own mind. because And that's if you're lucky. Uh, yeah, I think I have a grouse with the profession in the sense that it is becoming more and more, it has gotten so besotted with dotting the I's and crossing the T's that it has lost sometimes, you know, sight of the woods from the trees. That And the magic of the idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, at some point, this is a balancing act. That clearly, you want some rigor, but it, you shouldn't be throwing the baby out with the bathwater in, in this quest to chase down. The, that is something that we need to worry about. Yeah, we've got to make room for the shellings, right? That's the, <laughs> we seem to have completely flushed them out. I have one last question, which I think is the most important question during the pandemic. What are you binge watching? 
<laughs> I uh, binge watched Money Heist at some point, which I hadn't seen before. And that was fun. You know, one Indian show, Arya. I sort of got into it at some point, and and, and I ran through that one. Then I uh, went through an old series, Monk, and then my wife suddenly got into The Crown, so I, I kind of started watching The Crown. But I, I do remember seeing something, watching something else, which I don't know if you've seen a, a series called Ambassadors. Thank you so much for doing this, Amartya. This was such a pleasure. Thanks again. I enjoyed this tremendously. It was great chatting with you, and well, I look forward to having formal chats with you at some point. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to Ideas of India. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at s rajagopalan. In the next episode of Ideas of India, I speak with Salil Tripathi about what India can learn from Bangladesh.